Welcome to Psych for Psychology, a Nystrom & Associates podcast. Our host, Brett Cushing, is a licensed marriage and family therapist at Nystrom. Each week, he talks about all things mental health and therapy with guests, and you get a chance to dive into specific psychology topics that help promote personal development and wellness. And now, your host, Brett. Hello and welcome to another edition of Psyched for Psychology. We are especially psyched today, aren't we, Crystal? Mm-hmm. This is really fun. We've already <laughs> been having a lot of fun. I know, because, I was thinking that too. Yeah, we have with us today Becky Sanders, who is a psychotherapist here with Nystrom, mm-hmm. and she's also the Associate Director of DBT for Nystrom and Associates. She's kind of indirectly like one of my bosses. Oh, I'm a okay. DBT therapist, so make me look good today, Krista. I, too, am your boss. Right. No. <laughs> everybody, I mean, do you I'm ever feel really. like everybody's your boss? Sometimes. You know? Yeah, that would Sometimes. be a good podcast. I'm not really his boss, everybody. I just, <laughs> just thought I'd put him on the spot, you know? Well, we've been having fun, and 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 look, look at that. We're being so dialectical. We're having fun, and we're going to be talking about a very serious topic today mm-hmm. in relation to adolescents, teenagers, and... I think uh, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about this. I love teenagers. They are so fun mm-hmm. to interact with, and they can be rather infuriating sometimes <laughs> for us because, and I don't, they don't even like themselves sometimes, yeah, you know, because all the hormones are going everywhere, and, and yet we keep hearing about the mental health crisis for adolescents today, yep. and I, what, what we want to do is, a lot of times we talk about in the podcast, how we want to see our mind change and how we perceive other people and, yeah. and move from what is wrong with that person to I wonder what happened to that person. Yep. And so I'm hoping that people who are listening today can have that in a general sense with teenagers. We can we can move from seeing a bunch of teenagers and the mindset of what is wrong with them to deeper compassion where we can say, I wonder what happened to them and wonder how I can come alongside of them. So to help us with that today, Yay. we have Becky. Becky, hello. Welcome. Hello. Thank you guys for I, having me here. I feel like we need applause. <laughs> like in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we are thrilled to have you with us. And um, tell us, like, we're going to be talking a little bit about suicide. So we're going to just jump right into Got the it. deep end. Yeah. And who would you say uh, would be most at risk for adolescent suicide? Because we hear a lot about this today. Mm-hmm. Help us understand that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, um, so un- unfortunately, like, no one is immune to to this, right? And it is not my intention to come here today and scare the pants off of everybody that's mm-hmm. listening and every parent that's listening or um, things like that. But, I, you know, I think we all have... Um, um, you know, the propensity to have mental health symptoms. So that's the truth. Right. And what we also know is that, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a few minutes, but, um, we do see higher rates of suicide with kids that, um, are dealing with, um, already having a history of, um, depression, Mm. bipolar, Mm -hmm. um, BPD, which is borderline personality disorder. And I, and I think, um, I think that a lot of people don't, think that kids under the age of 18 um, could be diagnosed with BPD, but that's actually not how it it is anymore. Um, And so that is uh, definitely, you know, more kids that are more at risk. And then um, trauma, PTSD, um, we see that in too. So, um, you know, the thing that I really want to talk about, so this might be, so everybody that's listening, please um, don't fall asleep for the next few minutes. I am going to talk a little bit about statistics um, just to get that stuff out of the way to, to kind of, I think, really bring home how important this is for us to be talking about yeah. for prevention and preventative factors. I think that's great. It sets the table for us. I it think, does. So. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Good. That's I, perfect. Good. I hope there's no snoozers here. Um, <laughs> What we do know is that currently it's the second leading cause of death in um, in the U.S. Uh, second for, leading. Second leading. For across age groups? For 15 for, to 24 year olds. What? And this was according to the CDC and NAMI yeah, um, in, yeah. the, in, the, in 2022. Okay. So, so yeah. that is pretty serious to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then um, within, so the Trevor Project, um, which is an organization that, that f- uh, focuses on LBGTQ plus kids um, and, and teenagers, right, mm-hmm. and suicide. Um, they had done this like comprehensive 35,000 people study. Mm-hmm. And, um, and what they also saw was that kids both, um, 
within the LBGTQ uh, Q community and, and not, mm-hmm. uh, 20% had reported um, having serious suicidal ideation. Mm-hmm. And of those 20%, um, close to about 9% has, have had attempts. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, that's, yep. we're looking at pretty high rates that, you know, it feels really, as you kind of mentioned, Brett, just where it, it becomes close to home and says, what are we going to do about this? Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I, I think other things to note um, with that said, I, I, I feel like part of it is because we know that our brains don't finish developing until we're about 25, 26. Yep. And so that prefrontal cortex, which is that part of our brain that, um, that helps make decisions yep. and helps us be less impulsive and be more effective. Yep. It's kind of out to lunch totally. <laughs> um, until we're about 25, 26 years old, or, yeah. you know, it, again, it's still developing. Yep. And so right. the, the propensity to be more impulsive is there. Totally. Um, so I think, th- I, I think the neurology behind this is something significant to note. Yes, um, so. you know, yeah. th- th- is that, so yeah, that makes total sense. Total sense. I feel like mine is still developing. Like, <laughs> more, but. And I'm 28. Um, so, <laughs> Me too. Yeah. so let's talk about delusional things. <laughs> yeah. uh, for next week. They can't see us. They might think we're <laughs> right. as far as they know. Um, I know we're kind of laughing here, but I just wanted to say we were, we were talking right before we started recording, we were kind of laughing and having fun, but also then we'd kind of get quiet and be like, oh, okay, this topic is so serious but I think we're doing something really important right now which is we're having the conversation because I think adolescent suicide is one of those things where it makes all of us just it breaks our heart it breaks my heart when I think about it and therefore it makes me not want to talk about it but I think it is so important to just get the facts out there get the conversation going yes we can have some levity at times just for our own kind of self preservation and mm-hmm. I'm just really glad that we're talking about this. Yeah, I, just say that. I love that you said that because that's something that I want to talk about later too about Perfect. the myths of not discussing things okay. means it might not happen. So okay, and I that's love that, that is that's a myth. Um, Perfect. So Perfect. Yeah. Well, are there before my ADHD impulsivity <laughs> sort of kicked in here and yeah. are there other statistics that you yeah. want to share? Yeah okay yeah, thanks tell for us more. That. Yeah. So um Within the like the last, not only that Trevor Project st- study that was done in 2021, but also this, the statistics by the CDC for 2022, um, what what they've seen actually in the last several years, um, we've seen an, in, a rise in suicide for for Black Americans and particularly youth. Mm-hmm. Um, so in 2019, there was a task force established on black youth suicide and mental health to help decrease this. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's hopeful for me mm-hmm. because these things come out, this research is, is done and then people are listening and they're taking action. And so I get a little bit weepy because I'm like, Oh, thank God, this is something mm-hmm. is being done. Right. Totally. And, um, and I think on that same note, we're, we've also seen an increase in indigenous, indigenous communities, such as Alaskan natives in particular. Mm. Um, and I don't, I don't know all the, the, the reasoning behind that. Um, but we do know that the Indian country child trauma center has been established and that's a really, that's been a really effective resource. And then I also mentioned, um, the Trevor project and, um, and currently, um, in the United States, um, at highest risk for suicide are kids that identify as non-binary and transgender. Um, and, um, I think a a big part of that is they're listening, you know, this generation of kids that, that this current generation, these kids are smart and they are wily (laughs) and these guys like, which I respect the heck out of, you know, they are listening, they are motivated. And with that, you know, there's, there's dialectics, right? Like there's, there's good and bad because they're listening, they're hearing some of the stuff that's happening. Um, and I, I just listened to NPR, um, the other day and a kid was saying like, um, that is, is, uh, transgender. Uh, he was saying that, um, he had felt like he in his community was trying to be abolished. And it was, it was really kind of this strong statement and that, you know, he had actually heard um, a lawmaker in another state say such, such a thing. So I I think, again, being able to 
um, actually he used the word eradicated, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think that's the kind of stuff that we have to be mindful of too, that they are listening, that kids are listening, Mm -hmm. um, resilient. Yes. And, um, I think, uh, that term got overused during the pandemic. They're resilient and and they need help, Mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, so I, I think we have to really know and that. It, it, as I'm listening to you, too, I'm hearing they're listening. And my first thought is, what are they hearing? Right. And yeah. it, com- it comes back to me, and I'm asking myself, am I listening? Yeah. And um, what am I saying? What am I communicating? And, and am I listening? Sometimes we talked about yeah. in a previous podcast, like we ask ourselves as therapists, in a session, why am I talking so much? And, <laughs> like, yeah. I don't need to be talking why so much. Talking, yeah. And I think you're, you know, you, I just couldn't help but uh, have this thought in my mind as I was listening to you, Becky, that that's a good question, I think, for all of us mm-hmm. is are, uh, why are we talking so much and why aren't we listening more? That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that, I that really challenges I myself that question. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And therapy yeah. outside of therapy, for sure. And, and I, I, I think, um, you know, that just alongside of that too, it's, it's really being able to say, what am I um, tuning into? What am I mindful about what's being said here? Yeah. What am I noticing? What am I, what are the signs that I'm um, observing and not right? right. So, mm-hmm. so those are the things that we have to really hear and see and, and things like that. Well, we're listening to you <laughs> and yeah. we're listening to these statistics. Yeah. Yep. What, uh, Krista, do you have a question for, for Becky? Well, I was going to ask about, I think it's important to kind of identify maybe some warning signs that we might be on, need to be on the lookout for. Because we all have, you know, an adolescent in our lives somewhere, whether it's a client, family, mm-hmm. you know, our own kids. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, some of the warning signs are pretty consistent with what we would see with um, depression and, and, you know, other mood disorders, things like that. And it gets a little bit more nuanced than that as well. So, sure. so some of the things that we might be looking for is um, this consistency with isolation and withdrawal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Brett, you and I are both DBT therapists and, and that can often be a target behavior. I know that I am really like targeting for somebody is like, how mm-hmm. often are we doing this? How do we decrease? this behavior because we know it can lead to X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if we see that, that consistent isolation from friends and family and activities, right. Mm -hmm. Demotivation, things like that. Also appearing agitated and anxious and irritable, which is pretty normative for teenagers as well. Right. Right. And, um, you know, that's just one of numerous symptoms. So something to be on the lookout for, um, extreme sensitivity, strong reaction to criticism, Mm-hmm. Um, talking. So this one kind of stands out to me quite a bit. It's talking, writing, journaling, or joking about suicide. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> I don't know, do, do Brett, you have worked with teens in the past. Do you work with, I've worked teens? with, I have a few teens now, but I've worked with teens, um, all ages before. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. that's, that's kind of my, my wheelhouse. And I, and sometimes yeah. I hear this joking. Do you right? hear that joking as oh well? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, and sometimes I, I, I need, I was just realizing as you were saying that, like, I need to be sure I'm taking it seriously because I think I have a couple of clients that I know so well right now. And I know I've worked with them for a while and I know kind of like their sense of humor, right? Yes. So it's that thing about, I need to be taking this, like, I need to make sure I'm really paying attention to that. For sure. Because yeah. he does, he jokes about it all the time. Right. There is an, there's an old proverb that says laughter hides a heavy heart. Oh my goodness. And yeah, it really sure. applies with this, that. Yeah. With, I think, all after, mm-hmm. there is a kernel of truth, and so we need right. to really pay attention. Right. Now, I'm hearing this, and I'm guessing some people are listening, and they're thinking, okay, so this is what I need to be looking for, for you know potential warning signs. And yeah. yet, what you just described is kind of like indicative of all teenagers. Sure. So is there sure. anything in, like, how do you distinguish yeah. between normal teenager and, I hate that word, I'm sorry, uh, but you're... Typical yeah. teen and right. someone like, when should I be worried? Kind right. of. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a great yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, um, I had mentioned that I uh, the joking, and I just so for me, it's kind of like making sure just because this is a therapy client to talk with this kid's parent, you know, and just say, yeah, to say like, mm-hmm. hey, this joking, you know, and so we have clarified that before, and yeah. she's aware of it, and so I think it's kind of like for me 
knowing someone's baseline, right? Mm -hmm. And then if something is deviating from the baseline, but also digging into like, okay, I'm noticing that you're joking quite a bit about this. And so just tell me more. So I think listening again, back to the listening is so huge. But yeah, any thoughts that you have? And you? checking the facts with mm-hmm. that, right? Like, mm-hmm. so, you know, I, somebody the other day had said something that alluded to um, some life threatening thinking, and, and there was kind of a, um, a, a joking tone to it. And I stopped and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to yeah. actually check in with this because yeah. um, you know where, you know, how I operate. Where are you at with that? And so mm-hmm. I, I think really checking in and we're, and we'll talk again, you know, going back to, yeah. is it okay to ask questions? Talk about that in a few minutes, because yeah. I think that people are hesitant to do that because there's this mm-hmm. myth that I'm going to perpetuate this. I'm going to make it bigger and worse. Right. Sure. And stuff sure. like that. But, you know, I, I think, um, asking the questions, yes. I also like there, there's some other things too. I mean, I, I think we'll see in, um, statements from people saying things like I'm better off. Mm-hmm. I, I might be better off dead. Sure. I might be, you know, like life would just be easier without me. You guys would have an easier time without me as my parents or my friends mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. So you might like hear language like that, or there could be some planning, um, yeah. sort of language. If sure. you see kids kind of like, um, maybe giving some of their important stuff away, um, mm-hmm. you know, there's, um, can, can I share, should I share something a little, um, personal uh, there's so many yeah let's keep it real <clears throat> yeah when i was 16 almost 17 um one of my friends died by suicide mm. and if i you know and at the time i was i was an adolescent right i was a yes. teenager and so i look back at that now though yeah. and I, I go oh there were these things i wow. mean so we knew di- diagnostically what was going on for her she'd been hospitalized earlier that year um, yeah. i think at least twice and then she um she did have some kind of impulsive behaviors but a couple of days before, um, you know, she did this, um, she, there was some kind of goodbyes. There was this like, mm. Hey, I really love you. I care about you, which, um, felt lovely at the time. Of course. And yet I think, she, you know, that yes. was, that was her way of, of, of kind of planning this. So I, yeah. again, I don't want to scare people that, that when your child or, you, you know, your friend or this, mm-hmm. this kid in your life is being sincere about how they care about you, yep. that that means yep. that mm-hmm. they're, they're thinking of suicide or, or they're sure. planning right. something and it could be an indicator. Yep. 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 What no, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was please. just going to say this. I think this is a great, a great way, uh, time to kind of transition into can you ask? <laughs> right. Because, I was thinking the same thing. Because yeah. so many things, I, I so appreciate that you shared that example because that's one of those things. And I know um, having being also a survivor of suicide in my family is that that question of like, should I have known? You know, should I? So oh, I think, yeah. and then things, some things only make sense in hindsight, yeah, <laughs> right? Sure. So I think it is so important to just get clear about. Is it going to do, I think people feel like, maybe you, you've heard this, both of you, is people feel like if I ask about it, is it going to make it worse? Am I going to be like, you know, um, am I making it more of a big deal than it is? So, yeah. Any thoughts, either of you, on that? Yeah. I, I would love to hear what you have to say about this um, as well. I mean, my my first response is ask. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, because I think, again, research says this. And that Trevor Project study, I mean, it was, man, that was fascinating to mm-hmm. uh, to listen to. I actually listened to a podcast about that to prepare for this podcast. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and, um, and to hear um, this psychologist talking a bit about the study, she said what was so cool, her favorite part of that study itself was there's a question in there that we talk about actually in, in dialectical behavioral therapy too, which is what are your reasons for living? Mm. What keeps you alive? Mm. And, um, and a, there was a lot of answers, I guess, um, that were given back that were support, mm. right. That, that were saying I had somebody in my corner. I knew because mm. people had asked me, they had, um, they showed concern. Right. Mm. And so what we also know studies show us that, um, that you have one person in your corner, whether that is a family member, a close friend, a community member, member, a, pa- a pastor, mm-hmm. um, perhaps your therapist, um, 40% the, the risk of suicide can go down 40%. Yeah, so I that's pretty that. incredible wow. to me. And, wow. and, and that, you know, that kind of goes into in a little bit us talking about what are some um, things that we can do now and what yeah. are some preventative me- measures that we can take. Right. But I, right. you know, I think asking is, significant because it's never um 
inappropriate to show care. It really is not right. Yeah. And like, it really, yes, there are ways to do that that are going to get somebody to open up in other ways that that wouldn't be such a thing. Yeah. But yeah, what are you thinking? I, well, right I'm now? thinking that was highly profound, and I can't <laughs> let that just go by yeah. without highlighting. It's it's always okay to show you care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, of, well, of course we know that, and yet that's so profound because we sort of shy away from this, mm-hmm. which I think is why you're asking this, yeah. Krista, yeah. and. I think we we don't know what to say because we feel like I've got to fix this for yes. the other person, yes. yeah. and and uh, I, I tell my staff this, and and I tell listeners you don't have to fix it for them. You can feel it with them, yeah. mm-hmm. and as you're saying, just be their friend. Yeah. And I also yeah. think of how uh, I, I, one of the classes I took in grad school was counseling dysfunctional families, and <laughs> they highlighted the professor highlighted the the difference between a dysfunctional family. And a person and a company, for that matter, is how they deal with truth. Mm. And when truth is difficult and hard and embarrassing, the dysfunctional family, person, company doesn't talk about it. Right. They yeah. shy away from it. They focus on blaming other people. And then they focus entirely on appearance management. For sure. Wow. Because truth is the enemy. Mm. But the healthy person, the healthy company, the healthy family is going to see truth even when it's hard and difficult. Yeah. And it's still going to be the friend, and we're not going to work us on or focus on appearance management. We're going to do problem solving, mm-hmm. and so That's I great. think that really applies to yeah. this. That we can we don't have to move away because we don't know what to do or say. It goes yeah. back to what we've been saying already. Just listen, right? Yeah. Listen, yeah. and and this is reality. And yeah. I, I think when we shy away and we don't talk about it, it reinforces mm-hmm. the shame. Mm-hmm. So, so true. I, I think about that a lot. Like secrets breed shame. Yes. Right. Yes. And so I, I totally love what you're saying there because I, I, I think, you know, we get scared of messing it up, right? Mm-hmm. We get scared of like, I'm going to say the wrong thing. And I, you know, and I've been counseling for 20, <laughs> Boom. 22 years. So I like to make this ongoing joke that I started when I was 10. I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I, I certainly don't always get it right. And I fumble and I, you know, there's, there is, and, and you have to read the room and you do know, have to know your audience, right? right. And I, I think being able to ask questions like, you seem down lately, hmm. you know, or I, I noticed this post on social media. Yes. What did that mean? Or um, I've noticed that you haven't called lately. Is everything okay? I mean, you know, I'm, yes. I am the age I am and um, <laughs> I still have to check in with some of my friends that might yes, be dealing same. with some yeah. mental health um, right. symptoms, right? Or same. issues and, and, and saying, Hey, I haven't heard from you in several weeks. Is everything okay? Right. So, so um, we, you know, this is part of the whole drive to like decrease the stigma of mental health right. and, and the same goes for suicidal ideation, right? Like yep. it, it really, there has been nothing that has indicated that if we talk about, or if we ask about, are you safe? Right. And it's going to increase suicide. There's nothing that's indicated. That. So one of my staff uh, was talking about this with yes. uh, one of my DBT staff. Like, I've got a client who has uh, suicidal urges, and do I validate that? And we talked a lot on the podcast of leading with validation. Mm-hmm. And I think people think, I, I, I have to condemn this somehow. You know, I have yeah. to tell people, like, no, no, don't do that. And so we're leading with change rather than validation because we feel like if I validate it, I'm reinforcing and encouraging them to do this. What would you say about that? Because there are people listening and somebody actually has the courage to tell them I'm thinking about suicide. You ask the question and then they say, yes, actually, I am having a really hard time. Yeah. And then like, how do you respond? Do you say, well, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or so real practical nuts and bolts. That's great. What do you think? That's a great question. I mean, we often talk about in DBT validation validating the valid, mm-hmm. not validating the invalid. And the thing is, somebody's feelings are valid, mm-hmm. right? So right. I think I, I love what you said, and I love how you're coaching your team. That's so exciting <laughs> to hear. Um, you know, that, that we do lead with uh, love and compassion. Um, and, you know, I think particularly as therapists, then, you know, we're also searching for change, right? Mm-hmm. But, in, it, but in real time, in real life, when we're talking about friends and loved ones and, and things like that too, being able to lean into, um, wow, Wow, that's really hard. Um, I thank you so much for being honest with me, mm-hmm. and um, it can feel really scary to to think about, you know, to feel that way, right? Right. And so I think you can validate like that that is their experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, w- without being able to say, yeah, let's uh, let's 
continue like finding ways and means to do that, right? That's not what we're doing. We're validating how they're feeling. And what we know about suicide um, is that it is, uh, um, it's avoidance. Mm. It's a means to escape, right? It's it's a, just like other uh, life threatening behaviors, just like uh, yeah. um, substance use. Right. Um, like it, there's there's so many things that we do as behaviors as human beings that are to avoid these right. these big potentially like hard, scary you know things mm-hmm. that we feel. Oh, and how yes. validating! Because what I hear you saying is is yeah, it makes sense. You want to avoid, right? Who right. wouldn't? You know, sure. given what's going on for right. you. So you're getting at what the need is underneath. Right. right. Like if somebody's thinking about that, they're feeling, you know, maybe trapped. They're feeling like they have no other way out. They're feeling, you know, back mm-hmm. into a corner, so right. to speak. So, yeah, right. you're looking at, okay, here's where you're at. Well, so now, now what? <laughs> right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think in that moment, people are looking for that validation because then we can get a little bit more change oriented later. Like, sure. that would then, of yeah. course, like help, you know, somebody that I love, um, somebody I care about, you know, one of my clients to say that, you know, avoidance actually doesn't doesn't solve right it doesn't create the change that you're here looking for and in that moment what people are needing to hear is like uh, that 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 what i am feeling right now um is does it make me bad right Mm -hmm. and i think i think Mm -hmm. that is where um what kids need to hear is that i'm not a bad i I don't know how many kids have come in and said i'm so sick of being bad i'm so Mm -hmm. sick of being a burden Mm -hmm. and and again that's the language that we have to listen to yes that are indicators to something serious right Mm -hmm. um and and we can validate their feelings and then of course work on the challenge to that too later but absolutely yeah I, I kind of find myself wondering too. Um, so basically the takeaway about whether to ask is yes, ask, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I would say, because even if you're not sure what to say, you can even fumble your way into it. If For you sure. Need to, right. Yeah. Like, and, and especially when talking with a, you know, adolescents and teens, it's kind of like, it, it, it doesn't matter so much how you get there. Just, you know, I think listening and opening up a place to be a safe person for them. Um, So then my next question is like, kind of what can we do? You Mm -hmm. know, um, Mm -hmm. if we do know someone or know a teen who's really struggling or kind of, you know, as a, as people, what what are some things we could do? This is the hope, right? Yes. Like this is this is what I, I was. I'm also excited to talk about is because um, it can feel like such a helpless topic, and mm-hmm. I think that we can feel so helpless and hopeless mm-hmm. when somebody that we know, that we love, or ourselves are feeling yes. this way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about preventative measures. Nice. Um, because yes. there's some stuff in place. I don't know if you guys, um, ever, um, saw the body works display at the science museum. Oh yes. And they did one on, Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, <laughs> centrian, centri- so one is like a, a mythical beast and one is somebody that lives to a hundred. <laughs> okay. What, what is that? Cent- centurion, centurions. As far as I know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> people that live long lives. Oh, that's it. People that's, live to 100. I right, can't think of either, but yeah, yeah. 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Not yep. the yep. mythical beast. Right. No, um, not a centaur. <laughs> a centaur. <laughs> a centurion probably, right? <laughs> Different. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, so they've done all of these studies on like what, what helps somebody live a long life mm-hmm. and, um, you know, filled with, um, with contentment and, and health and grace and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and it's similar, you know, when we're talking about kiddos, right. I mean, yeah. there's, th- there's really just complete correlation there. And so what, um, what we know it's, it's having effective coping and problem solving skills. This is great mm. from a DBT perspective, nice. ability to regulate. Yeah. So knowing like I can have these big feelings, they can be really like overwhelming and painful. And yet I have these skills to be able to maybe check the facts, to problem solve, to regulate my body, mm-hmm. um, to maybe, maybe get better sleep and maybe mm. eat more effectively. Cause all of those things add to my mental health, yes. um, you know, being better or, or maybe not as good. Yes. <laughs> um, we have, you know, strong social and family connections is a huge huge part wow. of what helps people live long, effective lives, um, asking for help. And so access to mental health care. So I will say this, yes. um, for all of the, uh, the dialectics within the pandemic and all the, the difficulties, um, one, one positive thing for sure was the shift to telehealth. Um, mm-hmm. and, and what I mean by that 
is the access, right? Like we right. now, and I'm seeing throughout at least the state of Minnesota, um, we have access to people in pockets of the this state that we didn't really have access to before. And we have a lot of offices here. Yes, um, but but now they, you know, somebody from from far up north can come to a group or do individual therapy with somebody in Duluth mm-hmm. or in, you know, we have just opened an office up in uh, Bemidji, like, but they can do telehealth even with somebody in Lakeville or Eden Prairie or Bloomington, right? Because we have the ability to do that. Yes. So access to mental health care is huge. Mm -hmm. Um, Support from religious and or social communities. And then um, one thing that increases, um, you know, suicide in adolescence is access to means. And so decreasing access to means. Specifically. Yeah. Well, what are we talking about access to means? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So I want, I'm trying to be mindful about how much to, to share there, but like if you've, so think about something that could um, readily harm somebody Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and eliminating that access. So like in therapy, I'm sure we've all probably negotiated with people like, can you give me this? Or can you put that away? Or can you lock this Mm -hmm. up? Or can your parents do this? Right. Um, to, to decrease that access. Right. Um, and, and I know it's not a foolproof proof solution, but it it, it still decreases because again, if we're looking at, um, impulsivity, right. Yes. Not having that stuff like right here on my desk or right yeah. by my bed right. is going to help us to be able to um, to. So specifically, that could mean knives, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pills. Yeah. Medications, yeah. right? We have to manage those things. And it seems like, oh, a parent might be listening. Like, oh, this sounds really extreme, but... Mm-hmm extreme behaviors uh, are going to require extreme interventions. Sure. That's so. a great point. Right. I mean, I mean right. isn't that the truth, right? Yeah. Like I, I think that's, and, and, and those are the things that sometimes as I know as mental health professionals, we have to intervene with and really try yep. to come up with a plan um, for it. And I think with that said too, that doesn't necessarily mean forever. Right. right. So my goal with every exactly. kid I work with is to be able to say, we want to increase your um, ability to be more independent. In order to do that, we got to keep you alive. Mm-hmm. And so, in exactly. order for you to stay alive, Very we're going to do some of these measures right. yep. to keep you safe in the meantime until exactly. we get to this goal over here. Yep. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's super important. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Let's see. Other oh, other thoughts on ways we can. What we, what we can do? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, be there. <laughs> we we kind of yeah. talked about that, right? Be supportive. Non-judgmental. Yep. I, I think what what I want people to hear too is that you may not understand, yes. um, and you may not relate, mm. and and that's okay. That doesn't mean that you can't be validating, right? Yeah. We do not. I don't. There's a lot of things that my um, clients come into the office and tell me that I haven't been through, mm-hmm. that I can't personally relate to, and I can still listen validate Mm -hmm. and support them. Right. Mm -hmm. Super powerful. And I think, you know, a lot of times we were saying people are listening and they're thinking, I never know what to say. Well, try not saying anything right? (laughs) because like you're suggesting that is incredibly validating. If we're just there where they, they don't feel alone. They feel like somebody is listening, which is incredibly validating. Mm -hmm. So Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one of the big takeaways I'm, I'm hoping in a very simple sense, but it's hard to yes. not say anything either and just yep. be there. That's well, super it, profound. Totally. I think that's a really important point because I think people do feel so much pressure to have the right thing to say. And it's like, well, give yourself permission to not say anything, mm-hmm. you know, um, give yourself permission to just sit there and listen and maybe repeat some key phrases and, you know, back to the active listening. Right. Mm-hmm. And from there, it can unfold. That's great. Right. Yeah. But you do, you don't, you absolutely don't have to say anything or have a fix for it. Right. Now, if you're really concerned about safety, then yeah, I think yes. then it's like getting them connected with a professional, getting them perfect, uh, connected with resources, yes. you know? You so, got it. You got right. It. So that, that would be taking action. But in right. terms of just having a conversation, almost just like my goal is just to like speak as little as possible. Right. 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 Like yeah. about yeah. funerals, right? Yeah. Like we, we feel like I, you know, I want to take away your pain. This is so mm-hmm. agonizing and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And, yep. and, um, and so we've come up with catchphrases, at least in our society, like, I'm sorry for your loss. And, and I'm not saying that's wrong. Mm-hmm. I, I think being able to though, I just have a friend who just lost her father and, and being able to say, I'm here. 
Mm. Yes. And I love you. Because yes. I've got no other words that is going to make this right. better for yep. you. And yep. I'm here. Yep. Um, yep. And so, I, you know, that is like you, like yeah. you said, that's profound to, to, to be there um, and to show love and compassion mm-hmm. um, and, and really meet them where they're at. I, I think sometimes I get... Um, People saying throughout the years, what if my child is seeking attention? Mm-hmm. I'm like, so oh, excellent point. what if they are? <laughs> exactly. You know, like, <laughs> yes. you know, yeah. then, then maybe that there's, there's something that they're needing and that's, right. and that's okay. We need to find, a, you know, a way, a way. for them to right. get that in a, and, and that's effective, right? Not, not judge that and, and right. just notice and say, yeah, because I think parents tend to judge it and quickly go to, well, that's an inappropriate way to look for attention. Right. Well, okay. Let's not debate that, but let's, let's just notice that. That they are right, mm-hmm. and okay. Let's work on developing some skills to right. get attention more effectively exactly. because of the impulsivity yep. that can happen with that. Yes. And attention seeking can result in an actual suicide attempt. Absolutely, absolutely. We can't we can't ignore that. Mm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose I, I think um, as we get closer to wrapping up, how about like thoughts on resources and yeah. treatment? And That's... we've already decided we need Becky to come back for another one because. <laughs> This topic is so important, and we yes. need to do another kind of more. And teens too. in general, so it's probably oh another goodness. one, two, right? three, or four. Uh, <laughs> do you want to just be regular? I'm, I'm way less nervous than I was before. So, yes, uh, yes. We were joking because she was so nervous to begin with, and we we're like, "Oh, that's all right. You're just like a lot of teenagers, right? Like, what if I say the wrong thing? Yeah, or you know, right, what's people right. gonna think? And yet we're all like that, so we can." We can normalize that in you, and we can normalize that this is what's happening with teens today. We don't right. have to be freaked out. Mm-hmm. We can be their friend. Yeah, absolutely. And yep. so, one of the ways doing that, like you're saying, is resources. Tell yeah. us more about resources. So, um, so what's great um, is that there are uh, there are hotlines that are available, and <laughs> um, I know in the DBT world, we have you know our patients have access to us on, on a regular basis, right? And yep. so, um, and and some. Teens might not want to call, so texting. There are there are there's a lifeline. There's the suicide crisis lifeline, and you can call or text nine eight eight. I love that, and I think that's a huge thing for adolescents, right? Absolutely. Is being able to text. No, I know you know in, in the DBT world we have kind of limits, and being able to say if this is really life threatening, I'm going to have to pick up the phone and call you. Like we're yeah. going to have to discuss this. Yeah. And you know, I, there there is also like um, in here too. Um, there's a teen to teen counseling. Um, 1877 youth line mm-hmm. and and they can chat mm-hmm. so it's nice. beyond texting but an actual real life um, so chat there 1877 what is it youth line youth line okay. and they actually also have one for spanish speakers as well nice um and so some of these resources you guys talked about putting on oh yes is that that right? we're gonna send um we usually have a little description for each episode and we're gonna right. post you know some resources in there at least a link to some resources so that people can go and check that out too. that's awesome yeah that's so good yeah, yeah. Good. Well, Becky, we have loved having you this week, and I'm so glad that you could join us. I'm so grateful for the work that you do, and anybody in who works with teens and adolescents. Um, it's just so important. And I guess for our listeners, what I would say is, if you know a teen or you know someone who's an you know adolescent, maybe if and you're not sure how to broach the topic, you could listen to this podcast together, or you can send it to them and say like, "Hey, I just came across this, just wondering about your thoughts." I mean, I have um, two three year old nephews and a niece who's six years old, and like, I'm already like, they're going to be teenagers like tomorrow because they're already growing so fast. So like, I'm just already like, I want to be there for them, like, and be the auntie that's not afraid to ask yeah, about it. So it sucks. yeah. So anyways, well, everybody have a great week. We will catch you on the next one. Thank you as always for listening and please be sure to leave us a review. While this podcast can't be a replacement for therapy, we hope you enjoyed our discussion today and join us again next time. Nice German Associates is always available to those who are struggling. If you find yourself in need of support and help, please check us out at nicestermcounseling.com.